So, welcome. Um, I'm Billy Smith. I am the incoming Chief Executive for Association for Learning Technology, and it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, in this session, we're going to hear about our Level 5 Trailblazer group, which have been working on the Level 5 Digital Learning Design Apprenticeship. Um, so, without further ado, I want to introduce our panel speakers, who we have over in the right-hand side here. So we have John, who's from the Digital Learning Institute. We have Caleb, we have Daniel, and we have Simon, who's from LDN Apprenticeships, who if you've had a chance to meet them are outside um, in the foyer there. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to John. Hello, oh, great, can everyone hear me okay? Great, hi everyone, and uh, thanks to, to Billy and to, to Marin and to Ald for, like, just for giving the Trailblazing Group the opportunity to talk to you today about the, about the new standard in, in digital learning design. Personally, I've been, I've been involved in upskilling educators and learning professionals on instructional design and digital learning design for about 20 years, and like, you know, obviously the profession has gone through a huge amount of change over the last three years, but, but we've also gone through a huge amount of progress as well. Like there's, there's been a significant growth in job opportunities, there's new specialised skills developing in areas like immersive learning and accessibility. So I think it's really important now for for people that want to develop their careers as a digital learning professional, that we provide them with access to practical work experience where they can hone their skills, that we provide them to access with high quality upskilling opportunities, but also access to, to mentors who, are, who work in this space, like people like yourselves that can actually guide them through their, their career journey as well. So I think it's really timely today that we're, we're launching this new digital learning design standard. So in terms of the plan today, is we're, um, Caleb's gonna jump in initially and just give you a bit of a sense of the journey that the trailblazing group went on in terms of the development of the standard. And then Simon and Daniel are going to jump in then and just do a bit of a deeper dive into the audience, the structure and so on. And then Caleb will come back in at the end for a bit of uh, next steps. And I think the plan is we'll have plenty of time at the end for Q&A as well, if there's any specific questions. All right, thanks, Mel. Thanks. So um, my role at the university, I work at the University of Birmingham and I'm the apprenticeship scheme manager there. So. My role is I think I've got one of the best jobs at the university. I get to work with lots of apprentices from new entrants where it's a first ever job to people that are doing it as career development and progression. Um, and as part of, part of that role, I work with managers where they look at where they want to use apprenticeships and different occupations where we might use them. And if I go back to um, January, I think it was, January, February in the year 2020, um, one of my colleagues, academic um, Adam Matthews, came to me to say, is there an apprenticeship standard in digital learning design? So we had a look through the list of apprenticeship standards, and there wasn't. So we talked about how we might, might get one up and running, and had some initial conversations with some, some people from Institute for Apprenticeships, from different, different areas, different other universities, and thought, yeah, this is something we want to do. Then obviously the pandemic happened and we realized actually the standard would have been really useful three years sooner ready, but, but we were where we were. Um, around about the, the autumn of that year, the group really expanded and um, Adam co-chaired the group from then on with Donna, who unfortunately can't be with us today, but was a huge driving force behind the standard. Um, and Donna works for Foster and Forge. Um, and we had lots of SME organisations join, lots of um, large um, employers not in the university sector join. So it became a, a really big all-round um, representing standard. And that's one of the important things for apprenticeship standards is they're not just specifically sector relevant, they can be carried across in different sectors. So um, for lots of different types of digital learning designer roles. And, and the idea, I suppose, to create that was to create a standard that um, would um, be an entry point into the career of digital design or a development point. So the group opted for level five um, standard. So we went through the journey of developing the standard with the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. Um, so um, for those of you that, that don't know, you have to go through quite a, a, a grueling kind of stage to get through it so you have to come up with an occupational idea and an, a proposal and you almost have to write the standard to get approval to develop an apprenticeship standard now those of you who are not so familiar with apprenticeships might think of apprenticeships as sort of only purely for entry level in very um, certain roles such as um, 
construction, things like that. But actually apprenticeships now cover a, a wide range of roles and from levels two, which is a very entry level, right the way up to master's level. So you can do a master's level qualification through an apprenticeship. Um, and this is a really great opportunity, therefore, to develop these occupational specialisms um, and these occupational pathways. So the group um, got together. It was a very large group, and um, you can see um, the list of, of names up there, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but a huge group representing lots of different types of organisation. Um, and the big challenge, of course, is getting everyone to agree on what needs to go in the standard. Um, and then getting the Department for Education to sign off that that is what should be in the standard and that they're happy with that. Um, but it was actually a really good process and we had, everyone was really engaged in it. Um, we submitted our, our proposal. It, um, after a bit of back and forth, um, got approved. Um, and we were very lucky to have Marianne from the Institute of Apprenticeships, who's kindly joined us today. Um, who really drove it forward for us and made sure that we were able to get it approved through all the standards. So the apprenticeship is made up of knowledge, skills and behaviours um, and then has an assessment to confirm occupational competency. So just a bit about um, the, a few thank yous to some people who um, contributed a lot to it, and a lot of them are here with, with us today. Um, obviously, the, the two that aren't are just Adam, who really set up the, the standard, and to Donna, who um, really was a, a good force behind moving the standard forward. Um, also to Simon, who will be taking over very shortly, um, from LDN Apprenticeships, who gave us the insight, both of an employer, but a training provider as well, which was really, really helpful, because we needed, obviously, to work out how much the course would cost to run and all those sorts of things. Um, and then to some of our subject experts, so to Dan, to John, um, and Liz uh, Hudson, who again can't be with us today, but she did a huge amount of work behind the scenes on, on getting it there. Um, and yeah, then we got approval, I think it was the beginning of this year. Um, we got the funding cap approved and the standard is now ready to use. And I'll talk about that in a bit, but I will now pass over to Simon. Thanks, Caleb. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Simon Bazzoli. I'm the founder and chief executive of LDN Apprenticeships. We're an Ofsted outstanding and uh, recently B Corp certified apprenticeship training provider. And we specialize in delivering kind of industry niche apprenticeship standards. So we deliver everything from level three business administration to this new standard, which we launch in September. Um, we also have corporate responsibility and sustainability as one of our standards. So we really do cover a broad spectrum. Um, I've just been asked to talk a little bit about this standard in particular, the Digital Learning Designer Standard, and maybe talk a little bit about sort of what it entails and what it actually looks like for apprentices when they participate in it. Um, so Caleb's mentioned the sort of occupational standard, and the occupational standard is made up of some very broad duties, and those, those duties are essentially a job description. They are the things that we thought in a generic way uh, exemplified the role of a digital learning designer across lots of different sectors in lots of different types of organizations. And those duties are then kind of broken down into, Caleb referred to them as well, into knowledge, skills, and behaviors. And those are the competencies that each apprentice needs to demonstrate in order to be deemed competent as an apprentice and to achieve their qualification. So over a period of time, the apprentices sort of need to demonstrate that, that competence against the, the, the knowledge, skills, and behaviors. Um, and the standard recommends that that's about 24 months. It may be a bit longer, it may be a bit shorter, but that's typically defined, and the thing that, that sort of uh, determines how long that is, is really how closely aligned the apprentice's job is to the occupational standard. And the reason for that is that we want the apprentices to be demonstrating uh, these skills and behaviors and, and this knowledge uh, in a role in the in the real world, right? We don't want them to be simulating any part of the apprenticeship. So as long as the role is really closely aligned to the KSBs within the standard, that sort of determines the, the duration. Um, and that applied learning that the apprentices do uh, throughout their apprenticeship is a really, you know, that is the hallmark of a good apprenticeship uh, and it's something that we work really, really hard to make sure that all of our apprentices have the opportunity to do. So I think the next thing to sort of talk about is how do they learn it? What does it look like for an apprentice? So I think a big misconception is that your apprentice is going to be uh, 
at college or at training one day a week, you're going to have to let them out of work, and that's really not the case anymore. Um, so, helpfully, the, the Department for Education calls it off, unhelpfully is what I actually mean, but um, they call it off-the-job training. Uh, but this is training that your apprentice, time that your apprentice spends uh, sort of directly doing tasks that are related to the KSBs. And that's integrated completely into the apprentice's job. So they don't really spend any time out of work. They are constantly learning and applying new skills in their role. Um, and then we kind of overlay a couple of types of uh, delivery and support over that um, activity for the apprenticeship. So uh, we've got a comprehensive e-learning program that sort of runs for the duration of the apprenticeship. That's been custom built, in fact, by Liz, who was very, very involved in the um, in the creation of the standard. Um, we thought we'd probably bitten off a bit more than we could chew when we started creating an e-learning program for a bunch of digital learning designers because it, it, be, uh, it can't be second rate. <laughs> We'd get judged quite quickly. Um, so they, they have this online learning program which is then backed up by monthly live sessions. The live sessions are led by a skills coach and the skills coach sort of facilitates peer-to-peer -peer learning. It's a really great environment for apprentices to see how things work in other organizations and to understand kind of uh, a bit of the context that they work within and also the way other organizations might, might implement or approach a particular type of problem. Um, we run regular master classes for all of our apprentices. So that's where we would get an industry expert to come in and speak. John volunteered to do one for us today. Uh, I've just um, managed managed to get you to agree to doing one. So uh, yeah, we, we're kind of always looking for people to speak to our apprentices and give them that industry insight. Uh, and then because all of this is delivered remotely, one of the things that's really important to us is that we also give apprentices the opportunity to meet in person. So we also run in-person development days where the apprentices come together and actually start to build a bit of a community and a network around one another. So all this learning is pulled together by a skills coach. Our skills coaches at LDN are always industry experienced professionals who are coming to impart their knowledge to apprentices and sort of help that next generation of professionals to, to build their skills. And it culminates with an endpoint assessment. And the endpoint assessment is completely independent of us. We have no control over it. Um, it looks like the endpoint assessment organization for this standard will be the British Computer Society, the BCS. Um, and they will facilitate a kind of external independent assessment of every single apprentice. And that involves a work-based project, so that's a real-life project that the apprentice does that demonstrates all of the skills required by the standard. Um, the project is then kind of assessed through a, a presentation with questioning, and they also have a professional's discussion based on the portfolio of evidence that they build throughout the apprenticeship. And what's really exciting about this endpoint assessment, and because Alt was so involved, in the development of the standard, um, we've managed to map and agree that uh, by achieving the apprenticeship standard and completing the endpoint assessment, apprentices will be able to get AC MALT as, um, as post-nominal letters on completion of the apprenticeship. So that's a really exciting development. The other thing to say is that uh, Alta very kindly offered to uh, give all apprentices while they're on program free associate membership of, of the Association of Learning Technology. So that just also gives them another really nice bit of access to this, this community. Um, yeah, so that's that bit. That's this bit about the standard. I should say you'll, you'll notice that there are a couple of quotes uh, peppered throughout the presentation that we're going through. Those are from people who are starting our first cohort of the apprenticeship in September, 20, uh, September, yeah, end of this month. My goodness, it's quite soon. Um, yeah, so yeah, exciting to see it sort of come into life and becoming real. <clears throat> um, I'm talking an awful lot, so please do chime in, Daniel, if, I, if I'm saying too much. So just about who the standard's aimed at. Uh, Caleb's referred to this a little bit already. Um, so there's kind of two routes into an apprenticeship, and uh, the majority of people who are participating in this program are people who are already working in learning design, learning technologist roles. Um, and they're people who want to formalize their skills, gain a professional accreditation, and really deepen their learning <clears throat> and immerse themselves in the field. So uh, l many large employers are coming to us now and saying we would like to you know, upskill our existing employees using this apprenticeship standard. And slightly less common for the standard, possibly because it's at level five, uh, we also have employers coming to us to say we would like you to help us recruit an individual to join our learning design or learning technology team, and then they can upskill uh, once they've come into the role. 
Um, Anything you want to? Yeah. Um, well, I can add to that. So, as it says on the screen, yeah, these um, well, this standard is particularly aimed at or appropriate for uh, anyone that identifies as early career, um, or as Simon's just been saying, you know, people that's already in those sort of roles or identify as seasoned, um, you know, possibly about three years plus experience on there, um, or anyone that might be looking to transfer any existing skills that they might have. Um, so, I just take an example of my current university intern um, who's got a background in film production, you know, those existing sort of skills might translate well into such sort of role, but they might not be aware of this particular, yeah, career pathway, should we say. So it's, um, yeah, promoting that aspect to those sorts of in individuals as well. Um, and yeah, anyone that's seeking, well, in, in employment currently, as Simon says, or looking to seek employment in such sort of, a, you know, career or role. Um, and as we've alluded to, there's yeah, um, the intersection of both roles of a learning designer and a learning technologist, but it is suitable for both of those uh, particular roles. Yes, yes, there are you know, differences between them, but it is appropriate for both of those. So I think the next bit uh, we'll talk about is just uh, sort of the availability of the standard. Is that, is that me or you? <laughs> So yeah, the standard is, is now, as it says, fully approved and ready to use, um, which, which feels great when I think about the journey we've been on, um, just getting agreement. And, and it will be continually reviewed, and something like this occupation clearly needs to be continually reviewed as time goes on. And that's one of the great things about apprenticeships, they stay kind of up to date um, throughout. Um, so I think the first thing that you would need to do if you're looking at using the standard, either for someone in your team or you want to recruit someone onto it or even it's for yourself is to work out um, a training provider um, and on our later slide we've got um, kind of a link to that and the slides will be sent out so you can access that. Um, so training providers such as um, Simon's where you can have that conversation, look at how um, it will work for you and your organisation, how it will work best um, and what dates they have for the, the course to sort of commence. You'll see, as um, Simon's alluded to, we've got a number of examples. We don't have any case studies of anyone that's done it yet because the course is brand new, but we've got lots of examples of people that are about to do it. I think I'm right on that. Um, so um, by all means, have a look at those. So um, the two links you can see above, the top link will give you the details of the standard itself, um, which will go through all of those knowledge, skills, and behaviors we've talked about, um, and the duties. It's important if you're putting anyone on the standard to consider the duties to make sure that they can achieve all of those duties um, because in order to be occupationally competent through the assessment they will need to at some point, it doesn't need to be every day that they're doing those duties but they will need to at some point to be able to do, do those duties. Then go through the link of finding a training provider when you've worked out, work with them on, on how it might work um, and um, there's lots of support and links on there. And if you have any comments on the standard, what I would say is, you know, feel free to put them through to the Trailblazer group. You know, I think it's every three years that we ha or, or so that we have to review the standard. So we'll always be looking at how we can improve it. Um, it's the very first time that we've obviously launched it. We've had a huge amount of support from different areas and um, thank all those, those colleagues again, but also thanking Alt for all their support through, throughout the, the journey that we've been in and particularly Marin for that as well. So... Um, is there anything to add on that, Simon? No, I don't think so. You think you've covered most of it? Caleb's very polite about um, <laughs> about the experience of launching the apprenticeship. He says a little bit of back and forth, uh, him and Marianne. Um, Caleb was the rock of the Trailblazer group and was really the person who helped us to drive it through, so he was brilliant. <laughs> and, and of course, big thanks to Marianne because we wouldn't have got there, I don't think, without her. She was excellent account manager with the, the Institute. So um, I think now it's time for any questions, questions? if we've got any. Yeah. yeah. OK, so uh, you know the drill, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, please could you, um, using VVOX, um, enter <coughs> in your meeting ID, which is 113-812-368. And that is your ID for your VVOX. And if you could post any questions that you might have for our wonderful panel here. Um, a couple of things that I would just like to say on top of everything that uh, we've just heard from Simon and uh, co. 
um, is that this is very much overdue. We, I think everybody in this room recognises the need to have professional recognition for members, um, but also for people in these roles. Um, we are thrilled, and I know Marin certainly is, to have been part of this group, um, and it really in enhances our Seymour um, portfolios and, and opportunities for learners. And I think it's a real defining moment for the learning technology sector in terms of having this um, level five apprenticeship. As we know, um, apprenticeships are sometimes frowned upon, um, but actually I think the, that this program would be um, something that everybody in this room would, would really benefit from. So we have some questions coming in. Um, I'm gonna come and grab a microphone. Okay, so um, we've got loads of questions coming in. Um, the first one, which, here we go, is, is this, the only, is this only available in England or is this available more widely? Good question. Um, yeah, unfortunately it's only available. So skills policy is devolved, so the different nations have a different, they all pay, everyone pays what's called the apprenticeship levy, which funds apprenticeships, but only... England gives it back to employers in this way with the apprenticeship standards. So unfortunately, it's only available at the moment in England, but I would hope that um, the devolved nations <coughs> might look at it and come up with, yeah, and, and Marion's just said that the Institute have shared it with the devolved nations. So hopefully, they'll come up with something similar. <laughs> okay, and just, just a, note, a side note to say, uh, despite our name being LDN Apprenticeships, uh, we do offer the standard to apprentices anywhere in England. So, just in case you were wondering. Okay, second question. Um, is the focus of the apprenticeship learning design exclusively, sorry, learning design exclusively or learning technology? So where this um, standard's been written is to, um, yeah, to be quite broad. It includes both, uh, well, from our perspective, um, like both learning design, you know, uh, knowledge, skills, and behaviours, as well as learning technology. But you might be familiar with, uh, yeah, if you're in a learning technology role, there will be learning design skills in there, and you know, expertise, etc. Um, and likewise, with um, being a learning design role, there will be learning technology elements in there. So the way that it's being yeah, written is to. Um, yeah, to include that um, accessibility for everybody. Yeah, I think just to add to that as well, when Caleb had the slide there of the full trailblazing group, like you can see there, there's quite a diverse, there's a good representation from the ed tech sector as well, like Omniplex were there and, you know, so it was, I think it was really important though at the out, and this is important generally speaking, that it needs to be underpinned by good, strong learning design principles and science. You know, and I think the way the profession is going now with generative AI, you know, standards are going to become more and more important, as, as Billy alluded to. So it does, it goes through the full process, I think it's fair to say, Dan, it doesn't it? Like it, it goes through the whole learning design process and then look at how you can use technology to, to enable it. And that's one of the great things about this new standard is that it's going to kind of give you end to end skills, uh, regardless if you're a learning technologist in, in higher education, but equally if you're looking to get maybe into more employer led learning design as well. I think one of the other things to say about this kind of uh, this question of focus um, is it's one of the things that's really amazing about how apprenticeships work now. Uh, each person's experience of a particular apprenticeship standard is totally different depending on the areas of focus within their own role. So you might be working in a role which is very learning technology focused and therefore when you produce your portfolio or your work, that portfolio may be a lot more detailed and a lot more focused around the learning technology elements. It doesn't take away from the fact that you also need to have other bits of knowledge that wrap around that particular specialism. And that's what makes the apprenticeships really flexible and kind of appropriate for lots of different roles. They're very carefully designed and helpful in that, you know, you can, you can be doing different types of roles and have different specialisms and areas within that one apprenticeship standard. Sorry, just to add on to that, so yeah, the emphasis on the word focus, so that also depends on the kind of role that the apprentice would be in as well, so um, yeah, if they are in a learning technology role, there's an emphasis on that, you know, sort of duties, but there will be learning design elements in there as well, um, so yeah, obviously the standard, yeah, it needs to be achieved, and it's got all that required knowledge, skills and behaviours, but yeah, again, it depends on the role that they are actually undertaking in the organisation. Great, thank you. 
Um, so next question is, how can employers like universities learn more about how to get involved? Caleb? I can take this and then Simon, you have some points as well. So um, the first thing to do is to look at, at how you would want to use it, for which staff, is it for new entrants, is it for existing staff or both? Um, and this touches on a question I see further down as well around, um, you know, most universities do pay into the apprenticeship levy and have large apprenticeship levies. Um, so, so you can use that. Obviously, if, if that levy runs out because you've already utilised it elsewhere, there is other options for you through things like co-investment, um, where you can, can also, at, at a very favourable kind of rate, get, get the apprenticeship course. Um, I think it's about working out who kind of looks after that within your institution. Um, so I obviously look after that at Birmingham, but um, it will often sit within your learning and development or HR department. So it's having a conversation with those people um, and looking at what can be done. Um, and then I think it's getting in touch when you know what can, can be done. In, what you want to do is getting in touch with one of the, the training providers. I don't know if you've got an example of anyone that's kind of done that would be useful. Yeah, so I think we've had a com good conversation with the University of London today. I think University of Sund Sunderland, University of Sunderland in London even, apparently that's a thing. Um, but So we're talking to several universities about it. I think our first cohort uh, has been relatively quick in the launch. Uh, and I think some universities are a little bit, uh, there are quite a lot of processes to go through and things that need to get signed off. So it does take a little bit of time. Um, but we're we're really happy to support and be involved in that process to provide any guidance that you need in terms of aligning it to particular job roles or understanding where in your organization it might fit. Uh, my colleague Rob and I are here today, so we've got a little stand upstairs. More than happy to have a chat with you about it, and then we're kind of around to provide support and guidance and help you to navigate the, the tricky bits of the levy and funding and all of that kind of stuff. So I think the other thing that's really important to say is that all of this is kind of paid for through a sunk cost for your organizations. If you're a levy paying organization, which almost every university will be, um, and if you're a smaller organization, as Caleb's mentioned, there's really, really generous funding. So 95% of the costs are covered by the government for any of these training programs. That means that the apprenticeship costs uh, 800 pounds or something for you know an almost two-year program of training and even then there's opportunities to get that 800 pounds funded by a levy transfer so you know that it's a really cost-effective way for you to formalize this skills training opportunity within your organization fabulous okay so we are uh, unfortunately we've got we've got, probably got time for a quick answer if you could answer this one quickly so um, would this be accessible for those who already have degrees but in a different subject or area and i think this is yeah. a great question because yeah. it will appeal to many of our audience yes is the answer yeah okay. it has so, to be in a different basically you have to demonstrate substantial new knowledge will, and learning and skills will be gained from the apprenticeship by doing it um but if it's in a, a different subject area i won't name different subject areas, but um, then, yeah. Obviously, if you've got a degree in digital learning design, then that's a no, but if you it can be in any other area, right up to masters, even PhD, I think, is fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. We'd love to get through all your questions. There's so many great questions. Um, but I think we're gonna call that a wrap.